direction and with the right pieces with the right couple of news stories with the right couple of commercials with the right couple of themes on law and order and other uh, <laughs> dramas and sitcoms that that are pushing another way you can change public opinion in a in a into a whole other direction and we see it happen wow. all the time we've seen topics where when you surveyed the the, the american public 15 years ago 76 percent of the, the public were against a particular thing and you survey them now 60 percent are for it you know what i mean mm -hmm. you know so and 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 where you see where the media has absolutely aided and abetted in in espousing certain ideas you know and and manipulating the collective consciousness you know mm -hmm. so um and and now again I, we're all spiritual people i believe you know we all know the creator exists if you don't well you'll meet him one day anyway so you know you'll, you'll believe it then mm -hmm. but but i'll say this just on a spiritual level you know again you can't you, you if you understand, um, uh, okay, because I, I don't want to go 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 to deep. <laughs> go ahead, I'm, 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 I'm about to I'm about to Justify. really go there, Justify. but Justify. <laughs> but it, it it's like this. At the end of the day, um, you know, you reap what you sow. I'll just say that. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, and and you can see the reaping of a lot of what a lot of people have sown as it reverberates throughout society. So you see these ideas in the media first, then you see it start being repeated in society. Like, uh, for example. The first mass shooting that we heard about that I remember was at UVA. It was the Asian kid when we shot up all these people with the double yeah. guns and stuff, right? And look how many have followed that pattern because it was reported in the media and because they saw that. The reason the media doesn't report on suicides is for the exact same reason. They understand that if we report on suicides, other people who are toiling with this thought or might be wrestling with this thought might be encouraged just by not even just by the objective coverage of suicide. Wow. It just it can just be as, as objective as possible just by exposing somebody to that idea the media understand stands excuse me understands that there is a potential that they could exacerbate that mindset just by exposing people to it so look at all the mindsets that people are exposed to all the ideas that people are exposed to in the media and then the, that are repeated in the in the public you know and so even when we look at social media and we see these memes of somebody just in some random grocery store and they you know acting a fool in some kind of way and then next thing you know it's a challenge exactly so mm -hmm. you know that's so that's the power and that's and 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 again that's one thing that is that always um that never ceases to amaze me every single day and every single week month and year when i see something new come out or or, or i see uh, uh an idea sort of being promoted in mass that was a more of a niche a niche idea or fringe idea just you know a year ago or two years ago it, well you know it's so crazy so it's so funny darnley this conversation, and I know, I know you, so I know, you know, in our first meeting, we stood outside booths and we talked for like two hours. Right. right. It's like, I was, me and Allison were talking, and like you said, Darnley, as people who've been in media a super long time, we remember, now, I'm not saying that the old gatekeepers were necessarily any better, but, right. but they at least, there was a vetting. There was a vetting of information. If you told a story, you, you mentioned story arcs. Back then, I remember, and my, Allison always cracks on it because my, my instructor, Dr. Uh, Mr. Keller, who's still alive on Facebook, when I did television news, when he would say, you know, when you used to do a news story and you'd say, you say, uh, you know, the people or, or, or peop, uh, the sources say who. Right. Who? Say, <laughs> exactly. who? He'd say, who says? He, he, his, my, his, my, his, his voice is in my head when I watch the news all the time because I was in broadcast journalism and he, who, you know, or like you said, when, when you did move, I remember when I, you know, doing television news, you remember back in the day, some of the news anchors, you know, they had movements that they'd make. And, and I started to do the same thing. And he'd be like, what are you doing? Like, he, it was mm -hmm. like, he was, he was examining everything that you were putting forth. Like you said, darling, in front of the camera and, and then in your news writing, what are you saying? And so now, it's just crazy. It's, a, it's crazy town, right? Would you watch these stories? But uh, as, as you said, darling, I was at, me, so me and Alice were having that conversation about you remember the day when blah, 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 because you see these half ass stories now where it's just since all it is is just sensationalism. Right. And even like you said, darling, even when you think about from war to accidents and things that happen, you know, you have to, you, people never ask themselves, like I said, when you see an image, so there's been somebody got hit by a car. Uh, is there a reason why I need to see the person get hit by a car? Is there a reason why I even need to see the the image? Uh, actually, you can report it. You know, Mark Clark right. was hit by a car today. 
Right. That's all you really need. I don't need to see a vision, a vision, a right. visual right. of where he got hit or a blood spot where he was and all these kind of things. And then, like you said, Donnie, so people like us, you start asking your questions. Why? Like you said, even like with the way we cover weather now, now it's not enough to say it's going to be 82 degrees today mm -hmm. because somebody said that weather and traffic get viewers. Now they'll say it's going to be 82 today. It's going to feel like 99 degrees. Right. Okay. What? Wow. So first of <laughs> right. all, if 80, <laughs> 82 degrees feels like 82 degrees, it doesn't feel like 99 degrees, <laughs> but that's just another way for them to extend weather coverage or whatever coverage. Sure. And like you said, Doug, yeah, I, I mean, everything, there's a reason why everything happens but we never examine why. And, and exactly. Like said, you know. I mean, and, and I'll give you an even more, uh, I'll give you another example that's even more subtle because it's a combination of both what we see in the news as well as what we see in sort of narrative, as well as what we see in reality, as well as social media. When you talk about, because I know Mark and I are married, I don't know if Bootsy's married, but oh. when you look at people say, well, they'll put out statistics around, you know, the divorce rate, for example, like take that, this idea, people have, people who are, a lot of people who are unmarried will say, well, half of all marriages in the divorce anyway, so, right? And they'll use that statistic to kind of justify whatever their view is on it, right? But like you said, look at what's not said in that statistic. In other words, we see it in the news, we see it played out in narratives on, on, on TV, on reality TV, we see it played out in narratives like themes behind scripted shows, right? But what's actually in this 50% um, marriage divorce statistic? Well, one, annulments are included in that, okay? So if you say, 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 listen, first of all, actually, the, the, the divorce rate is, is actually um, around 44 percent today as of 2019. It's actually 44 percent, which means you have to actually off the break have a 56 chance percent chance of a successful marriage. Right. So that's one. Two, if it's 44 percent is the um, divorce rate and that includes annulments. Well, at least half of them, peop at least half of those are annulments. And I think we I think we can anecdotally know that probably more than half of the people and annulments are people who said, you know what, we ain't had no business doing this in the first place. Let's cancel this thing, right? <laughs> so once you take out the, so so let's see. Now, I think probably more than half of the people who get married say, you know, we shouldn't have got married in the first place. I think we know anecdotally that more than half of the people who get married probably should never been married in the first place, right? So, um, and I'm talking about these, those Vegas weddings, those quick little, you know what I mean? Those little, you know, kids run off and elope and then it's, you know, all that's included in that statistic, okay? Right. Right. So let's 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 say if at least half of these are annulments, right? And now you have the other half are marriages that people actually thought might have had a chance. Well, if that knocks that forty four percent down to twenty two percent is my point, which means you got a seventy eight percent chance of success now. Exactly. You follow me? But but so my point is, but in the zeitgeist, what it was this idea that oh well, no point in trying marriage because half ended up divorced. Well, half of the people, well half of that half who ended up divorced said we shouldn't have got married in the first place. So extrapolate them and say, hey, I'm not in that group. I know I should have been married in the first place. So of the people who we know should have gotten married in the first place. How many of them are successful? Well, shoot, all, damn near 80%. That's the real statistic. Wow. Exactly. You follow me? But it's not spun in the media that way. It's not spun in the environment that way. And like I say, when I say the media, I mean as an undifferentiated mass. I'm talking about in books and TV shows and, and, and you know, it, wherever, social media. This idea is just out there and it's spread throughout all different forms of media in this unexamined, unanalyzed way. People take that, that little narrow statistic and run with it and then say, oh yeah, well, you know, it, it's only 50%, you know, 50-50, I'm gonna get divorced, so I don't believe in marriage anyway. You know what I mean? So that's the type of power that I'm talking about that exists within this media is that it, it's kind of like, uh, people don't really get the news. They get an impression of what's in the news. Yeah. They don't understand what's important in society. They have an impression of what's important in society. And they automatically assume that the stories and the, and the ideas getting the most attention are the most relevant and the most important, and they often are not. You know, other countries, other environments will use the media to um, to uh, 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 censor people's uh, scope view of the world. You know, they'll 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 limit the media that they have access to. America does the opposite. We over inundate people. You have to sift through the garbage. You have to sift through this huge landfill to find a few jewels of truth. You know, so what they do is they dump a whole bunch of garbage out there and then leave you to sift through it and say, OK, well, you figure out you figure out what's. Um, was actually valuable. But most of us aren't even, like you said, Mark, like you alluded to, aren't even educated enough or aren't even um, conscientious enough to evaluate what we're consuming mm -hmm. 
and we're consuming junk and anything you consume that you don't analyze. I mean, I don't care if it's food. I don't care if it's information. It is the same effect. If you're consuming junk on any level, then you become what you eat. You are what you eat. You are what you consume, you know, and it's the same way that works in the physical sense. And I know you with your um, red sea moss and everything else, you understand that you, you are what you eat literally. And from a um, psychological and, and, and you know, uh, philosophical standpoint, the information you consume and the ideas that you allow to that you allow yourself to repeat and that you would allow yourself to believe that's part of your consumption as well. And mm -hmm. you have to really examine not just what you're seeing, but what you're not seeing, not just what's there, but what's mm -hmm. not there. When I created this show, The Breakdown um, for BET, the one that's up for a telly right now, that is exactly the pitch that I use with BET. I said, this is what's not on your air. This is what this is what your viewers haven't been seeing um, this all this time. And here's how we can fill a void that we feel is present in your current programming offering, you know, and gave them some, some specifics on it. And they and they went for it. And it's and it's been a huge critical success on that part, because if you go to that YouTube, if you go to the YouTube channel for BET and you look up the breakdown because they first released it on BET Digital, um, you'll see comment after comment. This is what's been missing. I've been, I'm glad, glad BT picked this up, you know, and the, the public, the intended viewer is reflecting exactly what I said um, when I pitched the show in the first place, because I saw, I saw not just what was on the air, but what was not on the air and where I could bridge that gap and present it in a way that matched and mimicked and rhymed with what looked like was on the air, but was bringing content that I knew was missing. You know, and so that's why it's very important for anybody watching this to do like Mark said, you have to you have to not just examine what you're seeing, but examine what you're not seeing and understand that there is no frame. There's not a single frame and a frame is a piece of a, a image for those who don't know a fraction of a second. There's no not a single frame that is on any professional broadcast medium that's there by accident. Mm. Period. See, that's and that's the part. That's the part right there. So if, I want to also remind everybody, I'm just going to scroll up the whole show. You can vote for for uh, Donnelly series. Go to peoples.tellyawards.com. I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes. I just want you to know, Don. I'm taking notes. Find the breakdown episode one and rate it five stars. We'll revisit it, of course, throughout the show. So, Donnelly, the funny part is, it's you know, and Bootsy, you deal with young people. I have young people, mm -hmm. and like you said, the setup. Hey, you got you got to give whoever's doing it. You know. White the white supremacy team. Let me tell you something. It's masterful because mm -hmm. they set up things in a way where, and again, for those of us who are a certain age in media, we we're, we're armed with a little bit more tools than than people who aren't because we 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 know how to vet a story. We know how to vet information. We know we don't just fall for whatever you hear. We'd be mm -hmm. like the first question we go because my kids, you know, hey, blah 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 blah. And I'm like, Where, where'd you get that from? Right. Now they interpret that as I don't believe them. I think I'm superior. I think they're not smart. You know what I'm saying? And that's exactly what I'm noticing. It's the same dynamic that happens with friends. You know what I mean? It's like, sure. um, and, and 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 um, you know, like like let's say, and again, let's say sexuality, right? I just saw if if um, if um, you know, uh, let's not do sexuality. This is, this is, this is, this is, <laughs> hey, I was sitting there wondering, oh, I don't know where this is going to go. <laughs> it, 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 could, it could be too, um, it could be, you know, I don't want to offend anybody, but what, what, what the setup is, if you ask a question about what you, like you said, darling, something that you've heard or something that's said, if you ask a question, a critical question, nowadays, everybody gets defensive, so they can't even hear your question they are fighting you. They're, you're going to battle. This happens with my kids all the time. I'm asking the question, where did you get that from? Who are the sources? Who yeah. say that? Like Darnley will, says, we're married. And long-term married people, you know, you get to a certain energy, you, 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 and you're around other long-term married people, there's a certain way that you move that and gives you, gives you information that if you ain't never been married long-term, or if you have not been inside of it, you really don't have the information that it takes. Right. And so these, right. when they do these news stories and they talk about blah and talk about blah, it's like that really has nothing to do with it. At the end of the day, what long-term married people understand is it's a commitment. It's a right. decision. A decision that we're going to rock to the wheels fall off, right? Exactly. That's what people on the outside sometimes don't understand. So they, they'll project, oh, do you see Mark Clark at the club? He was drinking. Oh, Allison might that. 
No, because at the end of the day, <laughs> there's pretty much we we said we're gonna rock till the wheels fall off. So right. that's something like you said that, that never really gets talked about, even in churches. Even yeah. in ch churches, church has the most judgmental. Some, sometimes church members and church leaders they get they they get stuck on stuff like. Uh, the man of the house, uh, the leader of the house, uh, right. sharing the finances 50-50. Man, you're talking about a theory versus what reality. Everybody works it out how they work it out. Exactly. Not every yeah. not in every married company, not every married couple has a joint account. You know, some do, some don't. But that mm -hmm. has nothing to do with nothing. <laughs> but, right. so, but it's like, same thing with these TV shows and, and like you said, these conversations and, and the people that they put in charge. You know, so Steve Harvey is a becomes the uh the, the relationship guru Relate, relationship guru relationship guru so and so becomes the so and so you know so and so becomes a news anchor it's like dude <laughs> that's yeah i've said the same thing about skip gates he's a literary critic but he's been put out by pbs as a historian and a, and a historical <laughs> expert and it's like you know anyway and, so, and again nothing against them yeah They're right check because the system there's a reason why you know there's a reason why they don't put you know, they don't make a person, like I say, a, a person who's married for 25 years, the marriage expert. Or exactly. there's a reason why, like you say, they don't make a seasoned historical expert, the history expert. There's a reason. There's now, why those reasons? That's all the conversation. Right. But what I, what I said, what I love what Darnley said, Bootsy, for that advice for young people was something that you just never hear. Arm the kids have them get their mind their thinking right first like mm -hmm. and you know nowadays everybody has a camera everybody has a microphone everybody right. has a video camera but what are you saying right. what are you we can i went to school to learn how to say it but what are you saying you know mm -hmm. what are you know are you a deep thinker are you are you are you uh are you do you know how to get to the bottom of the facts uh, as a reporter mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. are you just going to get on there and, and, and it's so funny because, again, we have great shows every day, but we don't have hundreds of thousands or hundreds of people watching our shows. Mm -hmm. But when I go to social media, when I go to YouTube, I see a person who's screaming or criticizing or 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 acting wild or showing a gun. Well, we had that on the show the other day. Uh, <laughs> you know, they get all those views because I realize people are in a space where a lot of times people even they don't want the truth. They don't want information. They just want to veg out on some BS. Mm -hmm. And I think at the end of the day, for whatever reason, we just can't, I can't deliver you just vegging out on the BS. So I may not be the cup of tea for that group. And that's why you just have, you know, 25, 30 people. Yeah. Go ahead, Bootsy. Um, so, so it, and, and that is an amazing assessment, Mark, really is. So I, I would love to ask you this as an independent contractor, uh, uh, African-American independent contractor, what are the pluses and the minuses? What are the benefits of social media today as we see it as a person from your perspective? Is social media, you know, you know, does it help? Does it hurt? What is your assessment of it as an independent contractor? I think that um, social media, like any media, is, as the name implies, a medium. And it's really up to what you do with it, you know. And so mm -hmm. I don't think there's any, I don't have any opinion in terms of an inherent um, moral positioning of the medium itself. You know, I think it can be very valuable and it can be very destructive at the same time, but you can say that literally about almost anything, you know? Right. Um, so I, I think that there's a, there's a tremendous potential, um, you know, for the pendulum to swing either way. And that's another reason why I'm, I'm so big on making sure that you're handling this, 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 uh, this medium with care, you know, and, and using it responsibly, you know, um, I think uh, it, it, you made me think of something, Mark, I keep this in my, in my, um, in my edit bay, I'm in the edit bay now. Gordon Park's what? documentary, and one of the things that he talked about was the camera being a weapon, you know, a choice of weapons, you know, and he understood that, he understood exactly what we're talking about now, you know, and so that's something that I keep, is literally right here, that I just keep, just to remind me of the responsibility and, and of the, um, you know, the tremendous amount of power and, and potential that this, that what we do has. What was the most impactful documentary or piece of media literature that had the most impact on you? Wow. Um, 
It really depends. I mean, there definitely would not be any one answer to that because yeah. there are some that are very impactful from a technical standpoint in terms of shot well, edited well. I would well. love to know. Some, I, I, some who, where I the story is to told well. There's mm -hmm. some where um, it might just be a, a, a very unique amount of access that this person had to a very unique sort of niche uh, piece Can of Can you give us a few of them, please? Get Man, them, um, them, gosh. Please. Okay, so, um, so for example, I'm trying to think, like, I liked... Um, I like, for example, like the Ken Burns jazz series. I oh, thought that, that was, was an excellent amazing. jazz oh my God. Uh, oh. documentary collection. And I thought wow. in order to do it justice, he needed to do at least 10 two hour movies because and if you're going to cover the, you know, if you are going to cover the history of jazz, you need at least that. And even with that, he was still, he, he, he was able to get a little under surface, but still had to kind of stay at the surface on a lot of levels. But I thought it was as well fleshed out as you possibly could. Me too. In a, in a, in a reasonable fashion, approach a topic like that. And I thought it was done very well and very fairly. You you know the one that the, the most Kim Burns thing that most had the the most impact on me was the one he did on Jack Johnson because I had mm, nothing sure. unforgivable about, black at black it, yeah oh my god like I had you know what I appreciate about Kim Burns is he gives you a great perspective on all sides of it you know what I mean of right. of things that we might know about but he goes so in depth I think the one he just did on Muhammad Ali was life changing like mm. the other thing about Kim Burns is he gives you perspectives and stories and, and video that you have never seen even through social media you know exactly what I, mean? I really think Kim Burns is be a, on a different type of level but but please continue because yeah I just want and, to and, and I think Kim Burns is an example of what we talked about earlier Kim Burns he doesn't live in New York he doesn't live in some major city he lives up in the country somewhere I think in in Vermont or something like that right you know and so he he is dedicated to his craft. He's dedicated to telling these stories, to reading, to researching, and again, mm -hmm. contributing something of value as opposed to just trying to do the, the quick little sensational kind of thing to mm -hmm. because that's what's popular, you know? And um, so as much as um, some of the documentaries that's come out recently regarding, like say, for example, the extrajudicial ju killings of black men that I've seen that have come out, um, mm -hmm. some of them have been good, but some of them have been just kind of following the trend and haven't right. really contributed to the conversation. You know, I right. like to think that the one that we created um, called the American Lows, um, the American Legacy of White Supremacy is on Amazon now. Um, it's, it's called what again? It's called the American Lows, the American Lows. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the one I mentioned earlier that was written up in the Washington Post and uh, and all that. But we the, the my objective in that was, again, contributing to the conversation that was being had around, um, again, Trayvon Martin and Oscar Grant and all these stories that were coming out um, between mm -hmm. two thir 2013 and now. But actually contribute something to the conversation that I felt was what was missing in a lot of the other conversation, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important element to any documentary. And that's one thing that I always look for when I do look at documentaries. I don't want to see just kind of the, what I've seen before, but I want to get something that only this particular director might've had access to. That's why I like, for example, the Lee Morgan documentary, um, they called him Morgan or I called him Morgan. Um, I think it was, they called him Morgan, but it's about the trumpet, jazz trumpet player, Lee oh, Morgan. Man, how tragic was that? Yeah, oh, you know, man, and, yes. and, 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 you know, his, 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 you know, basically in a fit of passion, you know, his wife or girlfriend, um, you know, shoots him on stage in a club and immediately regrets it, et cetera. Um, but mm -hmm. just to have the access to that, those recordings of the, of, you know, the, the voice, the voice recordings, basically the entire documentary is centered around these recordings that the filmmaker had of her because he interviewed her on, on audio tape. And she's narrating and and kind of the mortar that ties these right. bricks together throughout this right. throughout this film, you know. So that right. kind of unique access, you know, you're not going to see another documentary with that with that recording and hear her voice and that kind of thing. So um, I think, and there are a lot of other similar examples to that um, where it's I done thought, well. I thought, the, I thought when you when you mentioned that, I I thought of the Yeezus documentary just because mm. he, he had it over time, where you know who knew, who right? Knew and even right. even the different cameras, you know, from from a basic, you know, this who knew that was going to happen? It's sure, weird, right? and, and I still actually haven't seen it yet because I want to sit down, sit down to really Ooh. be able to give it the, get ready. you know, get, give it the time it's due, you know. And I didn't, I don't want to kind of watch it uh, piecemeal fashion, you know what I mean? So I'm going to find one of these Saturdays and Sundays and just watch all three of them, you know, back to back. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know what the greatest documentary, and I would love to know your assessment on this. Mm. The most impactful documentary that I have ever seen in my entire life, and I love media of all things, mm -hmm. was, was Hoop Dreams. 
Hoop Dreams mm. really did something to me. You know, I would love to know what your assessment of Hoop Dreams was, because I don't know if that was the first reality black documentary I ever seen, but it but it did so much to me. I would love to know what your assessment. Man, I, I did see Hoop Dreams years ago, but I I can't say that I, that it impacted me enough that I really remember, you know, or mm. or can recall anything specific about it. Um, for me, I think one of the most impactful series was Eyes on the Prize. Oh my uh, God! You know, yeah, oh because God. you know, uh, I think that it, again, just very well done. And, and recently, um, uh, uh, gosh, the, the brother who did the um, uh, uh, Exterminate All the Beasts mm. um, that that documentary series by Raul Raul Peck, I believe, I that. is the direct. Oh, that is uh, it, it's it's called yeah, it's called Exterminate All the Beasts, I believe, and um, it's it's actually a three or four part series. Excellent documentary that that covers the basically the scourge of of the spread of of a colonialism and white supremacy worldwide, uh, you know, and and this philosophy that they had. I mean, excellent. Actually, I was glad when I watched it. I was like, man, I'm glad I put my film out first because <laughs> if I didn't, a lot of people be saying I bit off this film because he had a lot. Of, he basically a, a lot of things that I go into in the American Lows, but American Lows is only 88 minutes long. And that's because I was keeping at a 90 minute film. I wasn't going to do one of these two, three hour kind of things. You know, I was like, no, 90 minutes is the outside gap. He actually take, took the time and did probably four, I think four separate um, installments, but goes way deeper than I was able to on a lot of the same things that we're talking about in the American Lows. So I've actually even told people the American Lows is almost the Cliff Notes version of <laughs> Exterminate All the Beasts. You know, I love, I love yeah. American Lows, man. I, I'm, I'm, I'm watching now. I, I, I love how you, I like how you presented it. And of course, you know, when you're like the the, the quality piece is just, you know, un, un, unparalleled. Yeah. Uh, uh, speaking of eyes on the prize, the, the, the part about that back to the mindset that I love is, you know, uh, in that you see the 12 year old Freeman Rabowski and, mm -hmm. you know, who, who's just retiring as president uh, at, at uh, UMBC. But just 12 years old, he, he was an activist at 12. And that, that for that to be captured, and then he would go on to leave this amazing life. I just think that's amazing, right? And Again, then, um, yeah. The, uh, oh, spe speaking of mindset, this, this, this mind right, this, this, this interesting to me, uh, Darn Lee, and you probably know the brother. I, I've interviewed him a couple of times uh, when he was, bef before he became the guy he is now. But, um, um uh, my man, um, 55, come on, 55 years old. Um, <laughs> um, he has the documentaries on Haiti, but he also has the books on pimping. What's, oh, know, Tariq uh, Nasheed. You're talking Tariq about Tariq Nasheed. Nasheed, King Flex, yeah. So Tariq Nasheed, on one hand, has these documentaries, right, which which are great, you know. But then the other expression is kind of some of that, that pimp shit. So it's kind of like... It, Darnley, is it is it is it that obsession with kind of wanting to have have it both both ways? I, I, it's almost like contradictory. Like on one hand, you know, you're giving us, like you say, this kind of thing that we need, and he and he, he's kind of moving like that. Like he's the center in L.A. that he's that he. I think he got the money for, but at the same time, I told Bootsy he was he was when he was raising money to get this uh, center, like for African American center, he was in his Maybach with the with the top down. Mm -hmm. And it was like, um, this message is kind of just, that's all over the place. Yeah, well, I'll, 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 I'll say this. I think, I don't think there's any contradiction between being Pan-Africanist and being, um, and being rich. You know, I think a lot of times Pan-African and rich need to be put into the same sentence more often, you know, because a lot of times people are turned off by the Afrocentric view because they feel like, you know, you got to be a monk, you got to be meditating in a hut somewhere. You know what I mean? Um, a lot of people use this derogatory way that they approach the term hotep and these kind of things. So right. I actually support the the fact that here you have a conscious brother who's also showing that, listen, I have some wealth as well, because hopefully that will attract more people who would be turned off otherwise and are, and are attracted to the wealth that the the guy with the destructive message has and says, oh, well, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, Tariq Nasheed, but this brother over here got a Maybach. He can say, look, well, I got a Maybach too, and I'm actually yeah. doing something positive. So I appreciate that aspect of it. I also think that um, a lot of things that he did around the, the Mackin and Pimp, he did years ago prior to getting into um, a lot of the more conscious programming that he's doing now. So I think it just reflects a, a certain amount of maturity that we all do. I, I was but, an MC. But the immaturity part is the tearing down of, you know, from the Roland Martins to whatever. It's almost like you're 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 lynching. It's almost like I don't think people realize that when you do that, you lose people too. It's almost you can't that that there's a group 
there's a group of people, a conscious group of people that right. if you publicly tear somebody else down and call them a nigga, right? I can't really, I can't really get on your train because I, yeah, you know what I mean? It's almost like your friends. You got married friends who are wild as shit. You just can't be a part of it because I can't I can't link myself to that irresponsibility. It's 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 a it's a place a character issue. That's what I'm saying. It's a character. Uh, right. Issue. Yeah. If you have a character issue and you're a leader. It's hard to get people behind you because your character. Uh, and when I say character, just like, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, I, the, whole, the whole list of the brothers. There, right. You, you can't be on social media calling somebody a nigga and then at the same time talking about building up the race. It doesn't. Sense, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But then I mean, again, that's just my opinion, right? And that's just my opinion. But I think that's that's where I'm coming from. You know what I mean? Right. It's and and like I understand. And and I definitely, I definitely, I definitely understand and, and agree with that that idea. I think that um, it's a touchy thing when it comes to our situation because we know that there are certain internal discussions that we need to have amongst ourselves. Here we go. You know what I mean? And but then we still need to have a unified front when it comes to the common the common obstacle we all face, regardless of whether you were left or right or whatever, right? Exactly. Um, so I do think that um, a lot of times it, it, it is and can be disadvantageous and, and counterproductive for us to take internal issues to the general public, you know? <laughs> so I, I think that, um, I think the, yeah, there is definitely some validity to that, to that argument. But I also think that part of what being free and part of what being autonomous is, is having differing opinions and understanding that we're not a monolith and understand that we do have, um, you know, somebody can't just call up uh, what they think is a black leader and say, OK, you represent us all, <laughs> you, you know, or you represent them all. You know, OK, so we got, we got a problem. Let's call up. Let's call up the, the, the big names that we know and they represent black people. You know, there has to be some of us who say, no, they you know, we may respect them, but they don't represent all of us. And there's another right. school of thought within our right. subgroup that um, that you guys need to respect and, 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 and uh, you know, and, and uh, acknowledge. So it's a touchy thing. You know, I get it. You know, I get it on both sides. I, I, I think that in some ways it can be disadvantageous to publicly criticize other black people as black people. At the same time, it can be disadvantage, disadvantageous to not do it if someone is claiming to represent us all and they indeed don't. But, you know, the irony, the irony of it all is and we always use the different groups to, 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 to paint the picture. But the irony is that because we don't have uh we don't have a real unified uh because we get we don't move because we don't know how to move in sync we will all, we will never get to the goal that we talk about you know what i mean yeah because, because it's like and that's the beauty of what with with what 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 they did which was powerful was you know with enslavement you broke down the ties the ties that bind right and so right. the other groups that have schools that they go to every day to unite to unite them that, that, right. that don't disagree in public they can say okay we are going to do this we cannot <laughs> and right that's the part. and i think even when we have success it still is not it only goes so far because we still can't say darnly here's here's all our money we're gonna we're gonna put it on you yeah right and, and until we do that it ain't going <laughs> Yeah, well, I think I think I think that's the dilemma. It's 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 the same dilemma that Harriet Tubman and that um, you know so many other of, of our ancestors had when leaving, leaving the plantation. Understand, like a lot of times today, we'll retrospectively look back and say, "Oh, these cats still plant on the plantation. Why don't they get off the plantation?" Okay, that's 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 one thing. But think about if you were in Mississippi in eight in seventeen hundreds, you in Georgia seventeen hundreds, whatever, and one of y'all was brave enough to actually get off the plantation to leave the plantation in the seventeen hundreds and escape to go north means never seeing your family again. Yeah, you can't go back. You ain't going back to summer summer break to see how people are doing back on the plantation. When you left the plantation, you were gone forever, and you knew that you would never see anybody who you left back there again, and they knew they would never see you again. So there are a lot of us who would have left the plantation, but not because we love masses so much that we did that we stayed. It's because we loved our aunts, we loved our uncles, we loved our children, our mm -hmm. nieces and nephews, and we didn't leave because of them, you know. And so what happens is those who, you know, so paralleling today, you have some of us who may may not necessarily have these um, particular ties or tethers to a particular situation. So they can say, okay, fine, I'm just going to leave and I'm going to do my own thing. How come everybody can't do that? But that person doing it may not have family at all. They might not have, you know what I'm saying? They may not, they may not be as tied in and roped yeah. into that place. So they are free free enough to be able to just 
go do something on their own. You know, um, those of us who are entrepreneurs understand that some people they you know some people need a job and and for good reason and 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 but and there are others of us who are more entrepreneurial who who can take certain risks and are willing to take those risks and we do and then we have some success and then people say well how'd you do it and we say well we we do left the plantation and we we didn't see our family ever again that's how we did it and they say hold on I'm, I'm not really ready to ready to necessarily do that you know that so so, oh, it's, so so the point is now we have a situation where you have some people who are talk, you're talking you mentioned success are, are, are able to actually have some degree of success but you have so many more of us who still ain't even free yet right so you can you can't be you can't be even talk about right. being successful when you ain't even got free yet right you can't be a successful slave those that's the real oxymoron <laughs> you follow oh. me and so and so when you talk about us um being unified in terms of kind of getting there what we have to understand is that some of us getting there means success, whereas others of us getting there just means getting free in the first place. Others, others, others of us are in a situation where it's like, hey, we can't leave the plantation. So all I can do is fight for better, better conditions on the plantation because I'm not in a position to do like my cousin did and leave and go north to Canada somewhere. I got to stay here in Mississippi because I got all these other people who rely on me. So we got to stay here and fight with Massa and deal with Massa to help things get better here on this plantation because we don't have the ability to leave this plant. So I understand both mentalities. And yeah. because of those mentalities, I think that there is a um, a uh, diversity amongst black people in terms of what, quote, success even looks like. For the person who needs to stay on that plantation, success looks like reforming the plantation. For those of us who don't need the plantation, we'll say, OK, I'm off this plantation. That's what success looks like for us is getting off of it all together. So those who are off the plantation then want to criticize those who are on. Those who are on want to criticize those who are off. Wow. You know, and these are all legitimate. What I'm yeah. saying, those these are all legitimate perspectives. You know, That's and true. so I think it's a mistake for That's us true. to kind of dismiss any of our perspectives. That's true. Um, and just understand that they all come from a valid place, and they all come from a place of us having a different set of priorities based on our own circumstance. And you know what? And I think you're right. I think the ultimate answer to it, and I'm glad we had this discussion. Was I think the ultimate answer to it. And I think that's something that that we offer we can offer here <clears throat> is it's OK for us to disagree. Mm -hmm. It's OK for us to disagree. <clears throat> we are down. <clears throat> and I think I think the reason I to clear up, I guess, my questioning and even my my criticism of Tariq Nasheed and some others. My criticism is a criticism, but with the understanding that I accept it all. So we can move into a certain degree, a certain right. degree. You, know what you I mean? understand we're ultimately on the same page. Well, and regardless. I, think, I right. guess that's what it is. I, I see I see these guys with all this power engaged in a fight when if we had if we could say, darn darnly, you and I disagree, but we move in this way. You know what I mean? Exactly. As opposed to me tearing Darnley down and everything that he does. I guess that's what I guess that's the part that I think that hurts, you know. And I, I get it. Yeah. I, I think I think oftentimes, though, like we said earlier, in terms of um, more of us need to be educated on how to consume media. You know, I think a lot of brothers like that um, or a lot of brothers in general, just not just to in, in, in particular, but I'll say that. A lot of times that's their attempt to wake their audience up to get them looking at the mainstream messages differently. You know what I mean? And like, in other words, is 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 they see all these um sort of um reverential references to certain figures, right? And then so for somebody to come out, it's it's it, 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 it reminds me of when public enemy on um when public enemy said Elvis was a hero the most, but he never meant shit to me. You see, straight up racist, the sucker was simple and plain, mother F M and John Wayne, right? Right. Now, for somebody who grew up in a world where Elvis was revered, John Wayne was revered, and you got these guys saying, man, F F Elvis, F John Wayne. For me, it, it as a kid hearing that, it absolutely changed my perspective. Like, you know what? Yeah, man, forget Elvis, forget John Wayne, right? Right. So I think a lot of times when um, certain certain members of our demographic are held up as representing us all and being the mouthpieces for us all, it does take some of us saying, "Man, forget them, man. We got to, you know, you know, you need you need somebody to to, to kind of you, you do need to disrupt the sort of hip, hypnosis that people can go under and assume that you know uh, um, certain figures are just to be to be um, unquestionably revered at all costs. But I hear what you're saying as well is the way you do it and the way that you approach it can be more um, destructive than constructive if it's not done right. But I, I'll, I'll say this, though. Um, I remember I, I think what it's about, too, though, is is creating a vision is is imparting on our people. What is the vision for the future? And in other words, I think a lot of times 
we will access certain ideas if we just know what's even available. I'll give you an example. I remember, you probably remember, both of y'all probably remember years ago, I want to say it's around 2011, it was right after Obama had gotten elected, 2010, it was during his first administration. And I think Tavis Smiley had the um, State of the Black mm -hmm. Union, mm -hmm. and he had like Julian Malvo and Cornell West and Dyson and Farrakhan and everybody sitting around the rectangular table, oh, remember? Yeah. And, and, they, and they were discussing, and, and a theme that came up, if you remember, a, a, a theme that came up, because it stood out to me, was basically, hey, there's there's almost 40 million black people in there. There's 40 million something million black people in America. If we kind of you know get on the same page to agree, there's nothing there's nothing we can't make this government do for us, basically. You know, because this whole meeting was about what do we want from this black president, et cetera. Right. You know, but I looked at that and I said, wow, um, that's a that's that's a true statement. But why is that? Why stop there? Why is that the vision? In other words, I looked at it and I said, well, look, if 40 something million of us of us is on the same page. We don't need the government to do nothing for us. <laughs> you exactly. know well, why don't we? Why don't we elevate that to the idea? Why don't we make that the idea? And let's build on ideas whereby we can leverage our own power, our own resources for our own benefit, without having to petition the government, without having to get third party allies and all this stuff. If forty something million of us with a trillion something dollars of spending power can't use those resources to do for ourselves, you know what? You know, what I'm saying what? What are we even talking about here? You know. So, but I think that that perspective wasn't the, the central focus of that conference because um, quite frankly, a lot of people having it have always assumed that our success would come through kind of petitioning the government in some kind of way. You know what I mean? And it would come through sort of putting pressure on the people with power as opposed and participating. And that's why you talk about participation and representation within the system as opposed to creating our own system. You know, dealing with our own system. You were talking about the the um, folks who have their own schools, their own day schools, their own weekend schools that they use to, yes. you know, to teach their, their 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 next generations. They're not going to the public school system saying, "Hey, how come you're not teaching our language? How come you're not teaching our history? How come you're not teaching our, our religion?" They said, "No, right. the public school isn't teaching our language, history, and religion. So we're going to make sure our kids go to a school where they do learn their language, their history, and their religion." Yeah. You follow me? And that's the same type of perspective I think that um, would benefit us as a people, in, if instead of Instead of using our brain power and to figure out how we can get somebody to help us, use our brain power to figure out how we can help ourselves. You know, and so um, I absolutely welcome the idea that you have brothers out here who are who are debating and wrestling with sort of the established kind of approach to black progress. But I do also agree that um, it can be done in a way that isn't um, that doesn't divide us and doesn't and and, and keeps us unified over on the main on the overall big picture you know what i mean it's like yeah. i would love to see a brother say listen hey I, I disagree with say al sharpton's approach or jesse jackson's approach or whatever but i respect the brothers they've been at it a long time i would not disperse anything they do we need soldiers on that front but let me organize some people who are going to fight on this front I, I i i'm of the mindset of malcolm malcolm said when you're being attacked from all sides you need soldiers on all fronts you know so i'm not going to sit up here and say sorry my eyes keep watering say black all black people need to join the democratic party or republican party or be independent we right. need to be everywhere <laughs> you know i'm not going to say that more of us need to be business owners and more of us need to be ceos no you need some ceos and you need some business owners we need to be represented in every arena um not for representation's sake but for leverage sake so that we can leverage the access that we have in these different arenas for our own benefit as yeah. a people as opposed to thinking about how we can align with somebody else's talking points because i think so often a lot of black folks are more so parroting white liberal talking points regarding right. black progress as opposed to actually analyzing our condition and doing what's genuinely best for us. You know, um, one of the things that Amos Wilson said is that if you want your black child, for example, to have the same education as a white child, you're guaranteeing your black child to be subservient to that white child then because white people aren't learning how to solve black people's problems. Right. We need a special education that will help liberate us from our condition. Education is only good as much as it helps you get to get free. Not just to get a job, not just to put yourself on the auction block. It's not it's not pig fat that you spread your degree all over yourself and say, OK, I'm up for the highest bidder now. That's the same thing we're doing on the plantation, you know, and, 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 <coughs> and I think the, the interesting thing, and I think maybe that's where we've all we're at an age. We're at a we're, we're at an experience level. We're at an age where, though, <clears throat> there's a couple of things that that happen, as you know, Darnley, as a as a business owner, who's not just a business owner who has a now you built out a, a system you know in place that you know it's a machine right it's a, it's, a, right. it's an infrastructure so it's almost like <clears throat> black folks it, it's like black people talking about or not black people anybody talking about like what you just said 
that leap he's talking about, though, the problem is if you're talking to people who haven't even mastered the how to get education, mm. right? If you're talking to somebody who does not have an education and you're t- what he just said, it's almost like this person has no idea what he's talking about. He, there's no way you can get from A to B. You know, you can't get from A to Z. You first have to get to A to B. Right. I think a lot of the problem is with these shows and even these conversations from like what you just said is that you're talking to a group of people who haven't got from A to B, though. And sure. so if you don't know A to B, just like that, that session about what we want from our black president, if you're not participating in your neighborhood, if you're not participating in PTA, if you're not participating in your life, you you might not you might not be ready to tell the president what you need. You don't even know what you need. Right. You know, and right. I think that's what we keep getting in. And so then people take they'll drop a like you said, they'll drop a, a philosophy to drop hold on to something else. But they you never really held on to any real philosophy anyway. So I think this is people like us. It's important that we have these conversations. But I think it also it's also important that we then show people. That's what's so beautiful about what Bootsy's doing. Boots on the ground. I'm taking children, young people who maybe have not had the best opportunity, access to opportunity. I'm mm-hmm. not only giving them access to opportunity, I'm showing them a trade, I'm showing them a skill set that now puts them in uh, an education system. Like you said, some people will say, well, but that education system's really just teaching you how to be subservient, right? But it has to start with some type of education, right? Right. Now, if you bring if you bring in a Darnley in, Bootsy bringing in a Mark Clark, a Darnley, or whoever. Uh, yeah, because I'm bringing both of y'all. So just come on, and just, just get ready. Uh, you know, uh, into the class and having these kind of conversations. Now right. you can give them for some perspectives because that's the part that I think is missing out. Uh, when you get when, when you get to a position where you can look down and see, then you can kind of say, like you said, Darnley. Well, like our, our, how this whole thing started, our, our kind of conversation on the different influencers. You say, well, Mark, I feel this way about this influencer. Right. We didn't have, you didn't have to tear anybody down. You didn't have to say this is right, this is wrong. Mm-hmm. You, 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 you give me your informed information on that person, right? So then you can say, okay, I see your point. And then, and, you know, and that's yeah. something else I want to start that doesn't happen is these kind of real conversations, but right. th- they don't result in people uh, getting really personal and then tearing each other down, you know? Yeah, I, I agree. Right. Yeah, that's, it becomes too much of a distraction. Um, and, exactly. and I think, I think too, and, and, and it also is, a. Um, again, we have, we're still recovering from, from slavery, you know what I'm saying? It's like Dr. George DeGroy talks about how, you know, there was never a mental health plan or mental recovery plan or therapy for, for um, you know, enslaved Africans who were then supposedly free. You know what I mean? So we are still suffering the ripple effects of that. And that mindset is one of them, you know, one where yeah. we can't disagree without being disagreeable, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, I think that, the, I think that again, just even putting this idea out there that we can do that. And that's one thing I do appreciate about a lot of the work that Will Packer's doing in the reality show world in terms of like yes. the love shows that he's putting together, black love shows. He's not showing black people bickering. He's showing black people solving problems, sitting down saying, hey, I have a problem with what you did, blah, 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 talking it out, resolving the issue amicably and deciding to be together or not or whatever they're gonna do, say it's a dating show. And I think yeah. just that example um, is what we can do more of. This is what I was saying with somebody who has an education. He got the same education as somebody else in his field, but he was able to apply it and right. through his worldview and through a, through a lens that he knew would be beneficial for his people. Because if you would allow somebody else, if you allow yourself as a black person to parrot somebody else's narrative about us, that's when you start running into trouble. You know what I mean? Well, I, um, oh, no, sorry, go ahead, but, brother. But but I think the main thing is great is that. Well, both of you guys said in the beginning, you know, darling, you said how you ventured to it as a as a kid at Mount Vernon, trying to figure out, not knowing what you did. Mark, you said you learned about it in in, in middle school, and I just think the more discussions we have, and the more we inter intertwine and engage with these young minds, is really what's going to be the key to developing the next wave. But also, I just think, and I've always looked at it like this, and I would love to, to know you guys' perspective. I almost look at journalism and what you two guys are doing as almost like art. 
Like I really believe media is art and you can paint the picture and describe it the way you is. The way, Dolly, you may see a certain topic or situation would be different, but as long as we can have the discussion and agree to disagree or get a perspective out of it, I think it's great. And I think that is the one thing that I'm appreciating about this, this you know, discussion as well. But the other thing is, and I don't know where I heard this at, and I would love to know that you guys see it this way. I heard what somebody pretty much said that they, oh, I'm sorry, Bruce Johnson said this. May he rest in peace. Mm. He said that he feel like journalism and media is a business of service. Do you guys agree with that premise or, 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 or would you change that perspective? What is your perspective on? Do you really believe at the end of the day what you're doing is service? I, th I think it is. I mean, and again, it just matter. Are you coming down and who are you, it comes down to who are you serving? You know, right. Um, what is the service industry, whether you whether you mean it to or not, whether you mean it to be or not, or whether you think it is or not, you're serving right. someone's interest. Anytime you point that camera. Matter of fact, a lot of times we talk about being unbiased in media, for example. And one of the things that I talk about in my lectures is that as soon as I turn on my camera, I'm biased. I haven't even pointed in the direction. As soon as I turn my camera on, I'm automatically biased because only but so much can fit into I have a 360 degree set or situation that I'm in. So I only have this big of a screen on my this big of a lens on my camera. I can't get all 360 degrees of what's going on. I can't get the last two weeks that led up to what's happening or the next two weeks that happened. All I have is a narrow image of whatever's happened in this big space. So as soon as I turn my camera on and point it at you instead of pointing it at Mark, I'm showing bias. Wow. You follow me? So yeah, yeah. again, you have to understand you. So you're always in service, and 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 so you're you're all you. you you have to recognize your own biases, rec recognize your so own sort of default mm -hmm. settings, and then do your best to try to compensate for those, or or own those. Say this is the bias that I'm approaching this with, and it's up to somebody else to come up with a opposing view, and you create balance through that. You know what I mean? Through having different people who are clearly biased in their various directions, and you kind of <laughs> work out the truth, or you work out a perspective through the balance of those. You know. But I would absolutely agree that um, it is a service industry and it's a matter of just, you know, you have to be very conscientious about who it is and what it is you are indeed serving. Well, and, 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 and to credit uh, Bruce and again, you know, God rest his soul, I think many, especially of that generation, but many uh, people of color who work inside a newsroom Put it on them, you know, they make it a responsibility to get that story told that probably isn't going to get told. They make that responsibility to serve the community from a standpoint of like when I was on Great Day Washington, right? I had they allowed me to, you know, pick pick things I wanted to cover. So I covered Dr. Rabowski, you know, I covered um, you know, Harold Bell. I covered and I, you know, because it was an opportunity to be able to flesh out a story from a perspective that is just rarely seen on television. So I think Bruce and the and the and especially the um journalists from that generation, they were all about that. You know, I saw the story about the young lady, the baby who was burned in a fire and he had a relationship with her her whole life. Mm -hmm. That's not a that's not a reporter coming out to cover a story. That's somebody who took it on himself. To not right. only cover this story, but to make a difference. So I think for him, it was service. If I'm honest, I think, you know, my success on the Big Fat Morning Show and my success in media and my wife, Allison, is that, yeah, we didn't want to get in front of the mic just so we could get in front of the mic or get in front of the camera to look good. We got we were saying that we want to make a positive change in our community. And wherever that city I worked in was, was that community. Right. And so I think you know, like back to what, Dar what Darnley started this whole thing with. If we have those type of journalists, then you can you can change the world. But sadly, I think there's a generation that just wants to be stars. I mean, Darnley, you talk, we all talk to kids all the time. A lot of kids just want to be stars. It, it, and sadly, um, it's to the point where you see a lot of it. You can see it in the reporting. Darnley, I was telling uh, Bootsy the other day, we remember... When, when I say nuclear power to our generation, a flag pops up, right? Nuclear power. We, we, the first thing we go to is meltdown right. and nuclear waste. Right. I saw a package the other day, Darnley, and they spent about this much on the negative part of nuclear power, right? So, mm. again, if you're right. watching this, if you're young, you don't know anything about it, you would believe, well, why aren't we doing this tomorrow? 
Right. <laughs> well, because we know, see, we know there's a deadly secret they're not talking about. And we see this happen a lot nowadays. You know, now you got the you know, one channel is going to lean extremely this way, another channel is going to lean extremely that way. And you're just seeing this BS. And and, and so, like Bernard Lee said, it's serving, it's serving all right. It's serving a message, it's serving, uh, you know, it's serving uh, misinformation. <laughs> And so uh, hopefully we can, you know, go ahead, darling. Yeah, I was going to say, and remember, too, it's also that's why history is important, because, you know, most modern media is is basically the first media, the first um, newspaper published in America was like the Boston um, Chronicle, the Boston Journal or something back in like 1721 or something. But the point is, most of these news, most of the, the initial mass media in America was was newspapers, you know, and then mm -hmm. radio came along and then television and then Internet. So the point is, though, most newspapers, pretty much all newspapers were started by some rich guy who wanted to just control the public opinion. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When you look at the history of pretty much every newspaper, it was basically started by like some rich dude who um, wanted to have a paper. You know, today, I guess people know, say, for example, Rupert Murdoch in particular, but he is very typical of the average media owner historically Absolutely. in this country. It's always Absolutely. been about somebody, some individual who uh, wanted to own a newspaper or own a TV station, or in these cases, own websites and these kind of things to, 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 to be of service to their agenda, their constituency, what the value system that they found important. So it's right. important that we approach this industry the same way. And instead of, instead of saying, I want to just be a part of this other machine and, and pushing their agenda, we need to approach it with our own agenda, with our own perspective, with our own mission in mind mm -hmm. and our own sense of contribution. Otherwise, we'll just get we'll just get caught up in, for example, talking about our people the way other people talk about our people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Or, or building certain assumptions into a stories that other people build into assumptions of stories that when they write about us. So. Um, so you know, I just wanted to just just, just mention that part. You know, the, the media has always been very directly and and un unashamedly biased, you know, and all but and unashamedly about a usually a particular individual person's agenda and opinion and, and perspective of the world that they wanted to um, promote via this newspaper. And 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 again, we look at it how it's happened in our favor. That's why that's why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad started the Final Call. You know what I'm saying? Nation Islam started the Final Call newspaper. So so that their group could put their their point of view out to the people, giving these papers right. out and saying, hey, read this, you know, so. And Frederick, um, Douglass, Frederick Douglass with the North Star, and Bootsy again, exactly. you got to have us because this is information that they may or may not know. My Look. Shout out to my, my grandfather, I.E. Foster, the Illinois Chronicle, in Springfield, Illinois. Mm. You know? And so it, it was like you it's said. So it was oh, oh, to, oh, to, let me, let me it's so interesting. Let me tell you, it's so interesting. I'm sorry, Mark. It's so interesting we had this discussion. Last night I was on a Zoom for, you know, people who live locally. You, in D.C. local politics, they just put off Kenyon McDuffie off the ballot for an old law for the D.C. state uh, uh, attorney general. Last night I was on a call with Marion Berry's uh, uh, wife, a whole bunch of people from our community, and we were talking about the narrative and how we want to collaboratively come up with an effort to talk about voters' rights for D.C. locals. And it's so interesting. Now, I'm having this conversation because, you know, you, you, I'm sure you guys will know, you'll be surpri surprised how voter suppression, but also how the media is, like, spinning it or whatever. So all this information is, like, really blowing my mind because I was literally on a call with Marion Berry's uh, ex-wife, and she literally talked about two hours about how the role the media played, the fact that the government spent $25 million in 1986 to investigate uh, uh, Marion Berry, which today would be $125 million, and the role that the media played in it. So I'm just, you know, hearing these perspectives, hearing this insight has been amazing. You know today. what? It's, it's Darnley's fault. Darnley. Um, <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. So, so and, and I, we're going to let you go, Darnley, because we're going we're gonna to push again to have everybody not only check it out, but also vote for your series. But, but Darnley, I just wanted to hop on this real quick. Bootsy, speaking of politics, so and, and what we were talking about early, Darnley, if we could, if only, and maybe again, if we if we um, have conversations like this, Darnley, you know what? We, we I would love to talk to you about uh, your studio and, and doing the show from the studio and, and things like that. Um, you know, to expand it, but like for instance, for instance, so um, Wes Moore is running for governor, right? And so now, and you mentioned earlier, Darnley, talking points, right? And we already know the play, right? We we know mm -hmm. the play. Wes Moore, you know, front runner, financial mm -hmm. front runner, 
He had all he checks all the boxes. He's a real threat. Now they're coming for him for this uh, not being from Baltimore, right? Okay. They're saying wow. he's not from Baltimore, blah, blah, blah. Now, the part about it so funny is, as Darlene <clears> talked <throat> about earlier, who cares? It's, it's not, it's not, a, it's really not an issue. You know, it's right. really not an issue. But man, they are, you know, the, you know how, you know, they are, the, you know, they, they got, the, this, they got the coffers out and they're, and they're driving this thing. And, and they know, as Darlene mentioned earlier, if you keep saying it, you keep saying it, you keep pushing it out there. You keep, you know, question mark, question mark. The funny part about it is if you just stop and think about it, we're sitting around a dinner table and they're like, what's, what's the issue? Well, in the book, he said he's from Baltimore, the other West Moore. And, you know, he ain't technically he ain't really from Baltimore. I mean, he he lived here, but he da 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 da. Man, who gives a shit? <laughs> right? Exactly. But but they're but they're they're actually making it. And as Darlene said earlier, they can make it a mountain. They can make this right. a mountain. Right. And if you let them have access to your brain, it'll make it a mountain. Well, what else is he lying about? You know, <laughs> it's right. Not, like, right. And so for 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 some people, it's like, who cares? But again, the media has the power to, to bombard your mind with it where it becomes something. It's, it, it reminds you of, of uh, you remember the candidate <laughs> and he was running for president and it's a reaction. Remember, we're gonna go here and go here and go. Woo! Oh yeah. yeah. Howard Dean. Howard, Howard Dean. Dean. Howard yeah. Dean. Oh. That took him out. That took him out. <laughs> right. Took him out. Which who cares, right? But it just it just speaks to the and I, it's going to be interesting to see because he also has money to counter it. But it's like, but again, with all this going on in this world, with all right. these real issues that are facing Maryland, they're going right. to make this a real issue. Wow. And it really it just doesn't even matter. But it goes it speaks to, again, the power of the media. So as Darlene started this with, if we can teach kids to wield the camera and wield the microphone and wield their pen, you know, we can make a huge difference. And even when we say huge difference, we're just saying making it a better world. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So, Darlene, but, but also got, a huge difference. Huh? But also a huge difference and a huge mm -hmm. difference. So, darling, okay, I have it. The guy here, vote. Go to peoples.teleaward.com. Find the breakdown, episode one. Rate it with five stars. Darling, what it. else can people do to help support this? Because it's going down today, right? They need to do it now. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You have to vote right now. Today, uh, Friday, April 22nd, is the last day of voting. Um, it, it opened up Monday, and people have been voting all week. And um, so, you know, this is the People's Telly Award is, uh, you know, so we're up against some good competition. You know, we have a few other shows from Fox and from Viacom and some other competitors up there. And we're proud to be a part of it, you know, and we're glad that people are watching the show enough that it's being considered for this type of uh, recognition, you know. So, um, you know, definitely go to peoples.tellyawards.com. And, and, and of course, anybody out there, you know, uh, we, you know, we do TV shows, we do high end video production, but anybody who might be watching, looking to, uh, might be a communications director for a company or, you know, a PR director for a firm or ad agency, you know, can definitely reach out to us at imaginationmediallc.com, which is my company. And, um, you know, we'd be glad to help you produce uh, whatever uh, projects you might have on the horizon looking for somebody to put together for you, because that's, that's, that's what we do. And we also want to announce a partnership with Mark Clark Media and... Uh... <laughs> Imagination media, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> There's no project we can't do, and and let me just say this, Bootsy, worldwide. <laughs> Indeed. That's right. Also, uh, for the worldwide. <laughs> also, is there any chance I can get you to speak to my amazing youth teen and college uh, broadcast journalism Abs students? Absolutely, I would love to. I would love Man. to. I want to talk. To, I want to talk to you about something else that we're. I was just talking to my wife about the other day. One of the things that we're looking at is starting both a um, video production training academy out of our studio, as oh, well yeah. as a scholarship for um, for students who are going to pursue uh, degrees in, for black students looking to pursue degrees in broadcast journalism. Well, don't worry about it. I have 18 students, but uh, I got 18 applicants right now, literally, that you can have the information in 10 minutes. I would love okay. that just, just have a conversation because we have a project coming that I'm having problems getting off uh, a situation. So I would love to talk to you off air about that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. We can definitely do that. And Bootsy, okay. that other thing we talked about, Darnley would be a perfect uh, place to do that, too, for that other need that's, that we you discovered was needed. Oh, my God. A massive need. Right? Yeah. That I mean, massive. Like I still get calls on this thing. 
Okay. Yeah, so, and, okay. And, and Donnelly would be, you know, yeah, we're talking oh about that. So, so itch day on the mix day on the mic day. No, right. Donnelly, man, it was a, it was a blessing. It was uh thank you so much, and um, you know, people are going to Congratu- vote. Okay. And, All right. And, and, and congratulations on everything. Really, yeah, if nobody. If nobody told you that, as a young black man, you know, being an entrepreneur and trying to get your feet, this is inspiring. This is motivated, but also congratulations, my brother. This is amazing. Thank you, bro. I appreciate that. All right, man. Hug the wife for me. Love the family, man. And I look forward to talking to you soon, my brother Darnley. Again, uh, if you have not voted, the information is right there. I'll let it scroll across the screen as we wrap things up. And Kellyawards.com. Uh, have a great weekend, by the way. Have a great weekend, everybody, and be safe. All right. Peace. <laughs>